good morning. I'm Morgan Micheletti, and I'm here to talk to you today about maximizing visualization and outcomes uh, for anterior segment surgery. And I'm located in Houston, Texas at Berkeley Eye Center. So with that, let's move on. Uh, you know, one, one of the, one quote that I like to think about is that for us to help our patients, for, for us to um, really do what's best for them, we have to be able to see and diagnose the problem. And so we must see so that our patients can see. And that's really what this is about, is improving your view uh, throughout your diagnoses and, and management of, of patients and using that to the full effect. So this is a roadmap of, of what we're going to cover today. We're gonna to start by talking about being in the clinic, capturing images and videos, uh, and, and the reasons that it's important to do that. We'll move to gonioscopy, and then we'll talk about different anterior segment lasers, followed by optimizing your view in the operating room with various procedures. So in the clinic, it's, it's imperative that we all learn how to capture good images in the clinic. And there's three primary reasons, and that's to educate, document, and seek opinions. So with education, we want to be able to educate our patients. There, nothing, you know, a picture paints a thousand words. Nothing says more to a patient than showing them a picture um, of whatever the problem may be, whether it's a staining pattern for dry eye, a dislocated IOL. You know, nothing tells a patient um, what's going on like showing them. You can educate your staff. Your staff help you will be able to help you more the more they understand as well. And then obviously your colleagues. So teaching and education are imperative and paramount to our profession continuing to improve uh, down the road. You know, it's also a great way to document it. It's so easy to take an image or picture at the slit lamp uh, or just through a 20 diopter lens uh, that it's, it's a really nice way to document progress of a patient's condition or disease. And then to seek opinions. So there are many times when I'll see a patient that is, you know, there's something very unique going on and, and I seek an expert opinion by texting an image um, or sending it via, you know, an email or something else or, or posting it somewhere and saying, hey, what do you think's going on here? You know, what, how, what can I do to help this patient? And so I think that learning how to do this is really important. So currently, you know, do you capture images in your clinic to educate the patient or a colleague or help in the management? How many of you are actively um, capturing images in clinic? I'll give a few seconds for this poll here. And obviously there are barriers to this, right? So um, digitization is, you know, something that is more prevalent in some parts of the world than others, um, but good. So about 70% of people do, 30% uh, of people, 31% um, are not currently, and, and that's okay, but I, I wanted to share that the, it, there are some really easy strategies. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an option that's not readily available and that's a, you know, data, dedicated slit lamp photo. Um, and then there's a, um, you know, this, this little adapter. Now this is really easy to clip on to a slit lamp. It's just a 3D printed, uh, and there's tons of these. This is just one example, but just to show you, I like that adapter in particular because it's something that you can readily just snap onto any slit lamp oculars. You can even use it in the OR, you can use it, um, you know, on a side scope, you could use it on a laser to, to document something if you have a side scope as well. And so I think it's a really great option and it doesn't have to be that model or design. There's tons of different options and it doesn't have to be a smartphone. It can be a digital camera, it can be a disposable camera. There's ways to do it without even using an adapter, but just holding your hand and adjusting the, looking at the, um, looking through the oculars with the camera lens. You can even take an external photo. Some of these uh, pictures here were taken with a 20 diopter lens. So these, the, the pictures on the bottom right here are actually fundus photos. Even though it's an anterior segment talk, these are, these are two interesting photos I took. So some Roth spots and then a macular star. But all of these are other things that I've taken with my cell phone through the slit lamp. And, and that's, that's relatively, uh, you know, that's something that's relatively simple to do. And, and then it's, it's already on an easy, um, you know, it's already on a platform that's readily available to share via text message or email. So let's move into gonioscopy. And this is a, another really, you know, any patient that has glaucoma of any type should have a gonioscopy uh, at, at the beginning of the diagnosis uh, and management, and then also kind of throughout the care of that patient. So in your clinics right now, how many of you are performing gonioscopy? 
And that can be any type of gonioscopy, whether it's in the OR, in the clinic, although uh, if you're doing it in the OR, hopefully you're doing it in the clinic first. Um, let's see what we got here. So about, okay, same, similar number. So about 66% uh, are currently doing gonioscopy. So good, so, so many of you will hopefully find, find this useful then. Um, why do we need gonioscopy? Well, there's this principle called total internal reflection. And what that means is when light hits, when light moves from a, you know, an object of, of higher density compared to air, you get this angle of reflection. And in the eye, that critical angle is 46 degrees. And so we have to overcome that. And the way we do that is with a gonioscopy lens, whether that's a direct or indirect. And what we do is we overcome that air tear interface. Now, there are some conditions which allow for the direct visualization of the angle. And some of the first ophthalmologists, uh, one of the first believed to visualize the angle directly was a Greek ophthalmologist uh, named Trantis, who viewed the angle through a direct ophthalmoscope in a patient with keratoglobus. So the angle, the critical angle was so distorted in that patient that by looking at an offset view, he was able to directly visualize the angle even with a direct ophthalmoscope. So let's talk about direct versus indirect gonioscopy. Now, in modern practice, we're using a gonio prism for this, and that's how it's always been. But, but for the most part, this is being done solely in the operating room. There are some pediatric populations where this may be beneficial, but for the most part, direct gonioscopy takes place in the operating room. That's how, it's, that's how I utilize it. Um, it's nice because it gives a, a wide view of the angle, and it's something that um, allows you to, you know, view directly what you're doing. It's not an inverted view. It's not through a mirror. It's a direct view. So right is right and left is left, which is important when it comes to surgical uh, management. And so as I mentioned, it's utilized in the operating room. Here's indirect. So the, the, there are some advantages of indirect gonioscopy. One, it's quick and easy. You can visualize, uh, you know, four different quadrants or six different quadrants, uh, six different sides of the eye uh, through a mirrored system. And the steepness of those mirrors can change how well you can see. So the narrower, the more narrow that a mirrored object rests on the cornea, the steeper the view you'll be able to see. So if you have a patient with a really shallow chamber or a steep iris insertion, and you're starting way out wide, your, you know, your view is going to be blocked. But if you have a narrower gonio lens, um, such as a, you know, a Volcormier or some of these, these other um, mirrored lenses, then you may be able to see over that and into the angle. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But for the most part, you know, this is an indirect view. So we're utilizing a mirror. That's the indirect portion. And it's inverted. So, you know, uh, left is right and right is left um, or down is, down is up and up is down. Uh, primarily used for clinical evaluation. So for the most part, this is what I'm using in the clinic at the slit lamp. And at the laser, whether it's an, you know, for, for SLT or selective laser trabeculoplasty. Now, there are a couple other strategies you can utilize with uh, the gonio lens. So with a, in a narrow bodied lens, you can compress the cornea. And that's really what this first image is showing here. It's compression of the cornea, which forces aqueous to the periphery and can help you determine the difference between primary angle closure and synechial closure. So in image B here, and I know it's turned sideways, but image B, that second image there um, in that first figure, you can see that the peripheral iris uh, actually deepens and is pushed back and so the angle is invisualized. So that would be more of a narrow or closed angle glaucoma. Whereas in the second image, and it's pretty subtle there, but you can see that the angle is still occluded uh, and that would be an indication of synechial angle closure. Now, the other image on the right here, the image on your right is showing what I was talking about earlier in terms of the steepness or the angle of attack can help you see deeper into the angle. So two different arrows here, the more dotted or dashed line on the left is from a wider lens. And you can see you, you, you would be blocked trying to look into the periphery by that steep and, and thick iris. But if you come at a more, uh, you know, more central approach with a steeper mirror, then you can see deeper. And the important thing is to have a gentle touch to avoid stria because there's two things that you can do, or there's a couple of things that you can do when you're utilizing a lens or a 
between a lens and clinic. If you push too hard, you're going to inadvertently open the angle anyways and not get a good evaluation. So you want to start with a really light touch. It's almost like a dust off, like you've seen a helicopter hover but not touch the ground and then gently lift off again uh, with minimal disturbance. So um, really practice that technique because if you push, you can get some stria, which can distort the view. Like I said, you can open the angle. Um, and then the other thing is, which we'll talk about here, is adjusting your light beam. Now, in these still images that I've captured here, you know, I've had to adjust the light. And in many of the pictures and, and videos I'll show today, the light will be a lot brighter and different than what you might see with your own eyes. And that's because our eyes are a lot more sensitive than the sensors in any camera for the most part that's, that's you know, we're gonna have lying around. So a lot of times you'll see more light in images than what we would use clinically for a diagnosis. So in these different views of the angle, you can see um, some of the anatomy starting to come together. And this is just through a couple of different views and a couple of different lenses. I wanted to show you just a video of what this may look like. Now, this is something I, I um, one of my technicians was kind enough to volunteer to, uh, to, to let me just do a quick quick going to go through a cell lamp camera. And so again, the, the light distortion um, is a lot higher because trying to capture this um, is a little more challenging than what you would see in your own eyes. So this is a much broader, wider slip beam than I would recommend. I really recommend a narrow slip beam because you want to minimize the light, minimize pupillary constriction when you're trying to evaluate the angle. Um, this is just another lens. So one of these is the Volk High Mag and then the other is the G4. And so this is a little higher magnification here. Um, and you can see some iris processes and uh, just, a, just a nice view of the angle. Again, in, in, your, in your own eyes looking through the microscope, that's going to look very clear compared to what you're seeing on the video. So tips for gonioscopy in general. Make sure you're comfortable. Both you and the patient need to be very comfortable. If the patient is moving back and forth or falling back, uh, you're not going to get a good gonioscopy because they're going to be constantly, you're going to be breaking that ear to ear interface. Uh, or breaking away from the lens and, and reestablishing that ear to interface, or if they're pushing forward, you're gonna get those stria. So stabilize your arms. You can use tissue boxes, you can use lens cases, you can use books, you know, something to give your arm a little support, especially when you're first learning. And that carries on into uh, utilizing lasers as well. You'll wanna stabilize your arm for that. And we'll talk more about that too. So dim the lights and narrow the slip beam. Again, that's because we don't want to inadvertently uh, constrict the pupil, which can lead to a misdiagnosis of angle closure or narrow angle glaucoma. Uh, too much illumination, uh, like I was saying there, can alter the anatomy, um, pretty much exactly what I just said. So let's move on now to the treatment. Now, we're not gonna go into too much detail about the angle. Um, you know, that's kind of beyond the scope of this talk. I'll talk about it briefly in terms of what it is, you know, how it relates to MIGS and the angle. But the main thing we, we wanna learn to focus on is, you know, identifying Schwabe's line Anterior, you know, anterior and posterior are the, primarily the pigmented TM. That's really our goal, scleral spur and ciliary body band. And we'll talk a little bit about those, uh, but first let's talk about YAG capsulotomy. So cataract surgery is one of the most commonly performed surgeries worldwide. And this is therefore one of the most common, uh, and I'll kind of put this in quotation marks, complications from surgery worldwide is YAG capsulotomy because it is a late finding after cataract surgery. And a good capsulotomy is imperative to good vision. You can ruin an intraocular lens with a poor capsulotomy. So again, being comfortable is key. You don't want to be uncomfortable. When surgeons are uncomfortable, there's good research. Uh, there's good data that shows that we make more mistakes. So take your time, position yourself uh, at your laser and know your laser and know that there are differences between manufacturers. And I mentioned that because a lot of people ask, do I need to use a lens for YAG capsulotomy? And the answer is you don't have to. You know, I, it, it's, for me, it's dependent on the laser. I have three different lasers uh, available to me in, in different locations. Some of them I use a, uh, with a laser, uh, with a lens every single time. Some of them I don't. Now, some of them work really well in the central three to four millimeters. And as I get more to the periphery and get some more of that effect of the corneal curvature, the laser starts becoming less accurate. And that's where a lens can be really useful. So for me personally, I use my, I use a lens dependent on the laser, number one, and then number two, any pathology. If a patient has severe dry eye, that's going to distort your view uh, or anything else in the cornea that may distort your view, utilizing a lens can really help you visualize what you need to see in order to affect the treatment. So with that, this is a YAG capsulotomy lens. It has about a 1.57 mag, which is great. It's a nice zoomed in view. 
it holds the patient's eyelids open. And I typically use a coupling agent, just anything thick, whether it's you know a, a gel, uh, like a like gentil gel or goniosol, um, you know, any of those work fine. Um, I, I personally just use gentil because it's readily available and easy and, and relatively comfortable to the patient afterwards. Now, one warning I want to give is, and I haven't seen this published anywhere, but uh, maybe I should write it up at some point, is if you ever notice this sign, this kind of concentric ring sign where you see um, kind of an egress of PCO from one side, caution, uh, you know, stop for a second and really evaluate, utilize gonioscopy, try to visualize where that haptic is. Because in this particular case, this patient was actually sent to me for a yak capsulotomy, notice this sign. Um, this sign happens whenever the anterior and posterior leaflets of the, of the capsule come together. And when that happens, you get proliferation of lens epithelial cells or these remnant cells in this kind of wave-like uh, pattern of encroachment. And that's a, that's a flag that this, lens, this haptic is in the sulcus. And so this is someone who I actually took back into the OR, rotated that lens and put that haptic back into the bag and then did a EI capsulotomy. So anytime I see this, you want to rule out UG or uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome, look for transillumination defects in the iris by doing retroillumination through your pupil um, or look for pigment dispersion, all signs of UG or uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome. So just um, something to keep in mind. So some, some YAG videos, and you'll notice that these are all different YAG lasers being uh, used. This one is, um, this is the one I use the most of. This is the LX laser, but I have some, um, some others, some Zeiss and some other LX lasers as well. Um, this is a patient who had capsular bag distension syndrome. And, you know, anytime you see this, it can shift, you know, you can certainly get a shift uh, in the prescription. Um, as that lens moves and is forced forward, it can certainly alter a patient's prescription late. So if you notice a patient come in that has decreased vision and a change in their refraction after cataract surgery, uh, definitely something you want to look for and rule out. Um, do use caution in some of these patients. There have been some reports that uh, it's a reservoir for P acnes. And so uh, just moving on here, here's just another YAG capsulotomy. Uh, this is one that this is a patient who has both anterior and posterior capsular opacification. And so I'm starting with the posterior capsule. Again, I typically like to do about a uh, one to two millijoule um, in terms of power with about a 200 micron offset. And then I'm moving to the anterior capsule here and I'm staying around the capsular ed the um, capsulotomy edge. But you can see that membrane, I'm just slowly peeling off the surface there. And I'm using about half a millijoule to a millijoule uh, with an anterior offset of about 100, uh, 100 microns or a zeroed offset. So either one would be fine. Um, I typically start with this when I see an anterior optic membrane. If it recurs, which a lot of times they can or do, then I'll actually take them back into the operating room. But just something interesting there. And then this is a, you can tell this is a different laser. Now we have a, uh, a red aiming beam as opposed to the green. Um, so in this case, I kind of call this a salt and pepper anterior capsular uh, membrane, but same same idea. So, you know, going to zero out my offset, use low energy. I like to start in the periphery um, because if you, you know, it takes a little more in terms of, of hits. And so if you do get some lens pits, at least they're in the periphery. Um, and lens pits really can ruin a lens. So, you know, really take your time when you're going more central. Um, you certainly want to be cautious of where you're, um, where you're aiming because, I have had to do IL exchanges on patients that I've seen um, that were referred to me for severe glare and halos after a YAG capsulotomy. So final tips for YAG capsulotomy, whether it's an anterior or posterior uh, YAG capsulotomy or whether you're enlarging um, a rexus, you know, that because of capsular phimosis and lens tilt, um, you know, you really want to target an opening the size of a rexus, no smaller than the scotopic pupil. So for nighttime, you know, you want to make sure that their that their rexus or that the posterior capsulotomy is taken out beyond what their nighttime pupil would see, and you want to free up any small pieces from the vitreous. So yagging the vitreous right around the attachment. So if you remember, there's a, a ligament called Wagner's ligament that connects the anterior hyaloid face to the posterior capsule, um, and that can lead to floaters if they're not yagged uh, and severed, so that all those pieces kind of float away or float down. Excessive lens pits, as I mentioned, can lead to an IOL exchange. 
I always start outside the visual axis because you know you just want to make sure that your lens is well calibrated and that you know where you are. And that kind of goes back to one of the first slides when I was saying know your laser. So if you're getting a lot of lens pits, take a step back, get a targeting card. You can recalibrate your aiming beam with where your laser is actually hitting, and that really is important. So use a lens in patients with ocular surface conditions or at risk of blinking or moving. It's a great way to stabilize the eye. Uh, as well as you know, prevent blinking and improve your view. You can also have a staff member hold the patient's head gently and just let them know, obviously, we're going to help you stabilize your head so that they don't pull back. Because with time, there's a natural tendency to fall back or fall away, especially if someone's holding something on your eye. And then obviously, installation of preparacane or tetracaine or some sort of topical anesthetic. So let's move on to LPI or laser peripheral iridotomy. Uh, you know, th this is used primarily in patients who have narrow or closed angle glaucoma. And we want to explore the iris in high mag because we're looking to hammer our way through the iris with the laser. And so I like to find a crypt because I know that that's going to mean less tissue uh, that has to be removed or lasered. I prefer to use a YAG only. Uh, it's a lot more efficient and it's less likely to close with time. But uh, you can do a combined approach where you use an argon first followed by a YAG. Um, it does have lower bleeding risk because the argon can cauterize some of the, uh, some of the vasculature. But um, this is one of those cases where I pretty much always perform my YAG, uh, my, my YAG iridotomies with a lens because if I do get some, some bleeding, then I can real easily apply pressure, which will achieve hemostasis relatively quickly. So here's just an example of some iris scripts, um, three different arrows. I chose the one in red. It's pretty subtle here, but um, it's in the periphery in a location I like it to be in. Uh, and it's a, it's a nice crypt there. So I'll show that video in a little bit. Here's, here's an iridectomy lens. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of got this offset optic with about a 1.7 uh, mag. And, and so I think it's a, it's a great option for a clear view. And here's an example. So this is a patient who actually was an angle closure. This is a light iris, so it didn't take as, as many hits. Couldn't really find a crypt, but you get that nice gush of fluid. You see that pigment just kind of come forward and you know you're through. Now, typically once I'm through, I'm not gonna go any deeper because there's zonules there. And so I don't wanna create uh, a future zonulopathy that, that I'm gonna have to deal with when this patient needs cataract surgery. I really just look to enlarge it. And this looks good enough. You'll see me take that lens off. And um, I'll check that patient back in about two weeks to make sure that the angle anatomy has improved. And this video, this is a brown iris. And so this is that picture I showed earlier. Let's see if I can get my video to play here. And so I'll, I'll target that crypt. And you can see that was actually one shot, uh, which is, you know, not, that's relatively unusual in a, in a brown iris, but uh, just couple shots here to enlarge it. Again, not going deeper, but kind of going a little wider. And I personally stay in the periphery and superiorly to where the lid will cover it as, as I think that that reduces glare. So look for that plume of iris pigment like you saw in both of those that tells you that you're through. Don't go too deep because there are zonules there. And transillumination is not a sole indicator of success. You, of success. you really want to see um, something behind it, if you can. Sometimes they're too far in the periphery or the patient has arcus, and so it's a little more challenging uh, to do a direct visualization. But just because you get translumination doesn't mean you're all the way through. There are there can be a membrane or some clear iris cells there that are covering uh, that area, some non-pigmented cells. So I like to do a repeat gonioscopy in about two weeks to confirm the angle anatomy is improved. If it's not, uh, that's when you can talk about other options such as um, cataract surgery or uh, a laser pupilloplasty to improve the angle of anatomy. So the final laser procedure we'll talk about before we dive into the operating room is SLT. So just like we were talking about for gonioscopy, this is really the same, except for now you're certainly going to use a coupling agent, a coupling agent such as um, gentile or uh, some sort of ophthalmic gel to couple the lens to the eye. So control the stria, you actually can rotate the lens. Once you get pretty good at SLT, instead of moving the joystick, like on your slit lamp and having to move all the way around, you can actually, as you're firing, gently rotate the lens, stay neutral and treat one quadrant at a time uh, in doing so. 
Now you can use a larger beam in, in these cases. Once you're doing the treatment, you're not trying, you're not looking for a diagnosis as you've already diagnosed them. So constricting the pupil with myotics or with a beam of light is totally fine in these cases. And I'll try to get as much illumination as I can while keeping the patient comfortable. I generally apply about 80 to 100 shots over 180 to 360 degrees, although I typically will go ahead and apply about 20 to 25 shots per quadrant, 360 degrees around. And one of the nice things about SLT, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit later, is it is repeatable. So even if you do a 360 degree treatment, you're not getting the effect you want, you can repeat it um, even on a 360 treatment, which is nice. Now, most surgeons won't go more than two treatments. You know, I've, I've heard of some people doing three. I typically won't do more than, than two if, if I do repeat it. So a couple different options, uh, and there's more than this, but these are just what, what I have in my repertoire is, um, and you really could use any indirect gonio, prism, uh, gonio lens for this, but there's, there's a three mirror here. There's a, there's a Latina um, so a couple single mirrors. And then my personal favorite is the bulk rapid SLT. And that's the one here on the top left. What, what I love so much about this lens is you can see it's, it's smaller than all the other ones. And so it's really easy to rotate in your fingers. It also gives you a nice steep approach. So even in uh, smaller eyes, I can visualize the angle a lot easier because of, as we talked about earlier, that steeper approach allows you to see deeper, even with unusual iris anatomy. And so with, with that lens, I can efficiently do a selective laser trabeculoplasty in 60 to 90 seconds, uh, which, which is really nice. It's, and that's not about you know, me just getting through a procedure factor faster. That's about helping the patient, right? This, this is, you know, the patient's worried. Well, if you're sitting there and doing an SLT for five, six minutes, that can lead to patient discomfort and concern. And so being efficient is, is key, but don't be afraid to take more time if you need it, right? So treatment is first and patient comfort uh, is kind of right after that. So um, here is a video of an SLT. And this is through a rapid SLT lens. You can see it's a great view. Um, you can see that dense, that darkly pigmented uh, TM there, that regular meshwork with the skull spur underneath. And I just kind of, you kind of just know where you've already applied it primarily because you're going to see some bubbles emanating from that area. So I knew that I started centrally, moved to the right, and then came back to the left. Now I'm just going to go to a different quadrant. And you can just tick off one quadrant at a time. You can go left to right or start in the middle and work all the way around. You can start at noon and then rotate the lens, you know, clockwise 360 degrees. So lots of different ways to do this. Uh, some final SLT chip, uh, tips. Look for champagne bubbles. That's those great, beautiful bubbles that uh, come out of, uh, you know, from, from the uh, tissue being um, modified and, you know, perform it by mirror. It's, it's mirror by mirror, like I was saying, you can do the superior and then inferior left and right or whatever it may be that, that fits your comfort, but that's how you keep track of kind of where you are. Um, oh, and, and in regards to the champagne bubbles, you'll notice them more when you're treating, when you're treating inferiorly, they'll move a lot more because when you're treating inferiorly, you're looking through the superior uh, mirror, but those bubbles will rise up because they're less dense than aqueous. And so you'll notice them a lot more than when you're looking through the inferior mirror, treating the superior side, you will see champagne bubbles, but they're not going to be as obvious because they're going to form and then stay right where they are which is my next point. Perfect. So a, uh, you know, it's, it's not a contraindication or limiting uh, future factor for MIGS. You can still do angle procedures, even with SLT, and you can repeat it if needed. So let's move into the operating room. We've got about 10 minutes left and a lot to cover here. So I'm going to move a little fat, a little faster, but, uh, you know, the first thing you should do in the operating room for any surgery is minimize your accommodation. If you're someone who still has accommodation, you have to learn to minimize it, especially if you're gonna have a long day in surgery, uh, whether you're you know, in there for six hours, 10 hours, whatever it may be, however many cases you're doing, you, you just gotta do this. So I always put in my, um, my refraction. I unfortunately wasn't a LASIK candidate, so I am a minus 150. Uh, so I do dial that in and then I zoom in on the limbal vessels, find focus out until it's blurry, find focus in until it's clear, and then zoom back out to that normal view. This will help your technicians and or trainees who are looking through the side scope uh, if they're having issues accommodating as well. And then I always adjust that the first thing I do when I walk into the OR is make sure that the patient's head is flat. So I'll adjust that of the bed, make sure it's parallel to the ground. I like to keep my back straight, my eyes straight, pupillary distance uh, correct, and make sure you're at a comfortable working distance and that the patient eye level as notated on your fake emulsification machine, 
uh, is is in line with the patient's eye. And then obviously make sure your, your knees and feet are comfortable on the pedals, typically about a 90, 90 degrees. Again, the more comfortable you are, the better your view is going to be and the more comfortable you're gonna be throughout the day. So here's just a, a quick view of me at the end of the case, just zooming in on the limbus here. And I'm gonna look at those limbal vessels. I'm already focused out. So I know that all I have to do is focus in and then I'm gonna zoom back out. And now I know that I'm focused right on the interior capsule, which is where I wanna be for cataract surgery. Now, uh, another part of getting a good view is, uh, you know, opening up some synechia. This is a quick posterior synechia lysis. And then you can drizzle some tripan blue. This is a mature lens. So I'm gonna drizzle some tripan blue under the iris there using an air bubble. And then another thing that can decrease your view is a poorly dilated pupil. And so here you'll see, a, that, that's just a, a one-handed, um, technique for putting in a Mayugan ring, and then the procedure carries on as normal. So that, that's kind of my, uh, that was my go-to for small pupils and for management of white cataracts. Now, for the most part, I'm using uh, Zepto or the precision pulse capsulotomy. Now, one caution about using tripan blue in patients with zonulopathy, you'll notice that there is a blue view here, and this is not super fun if you get it. Um, it can turn the entire eye what looks to be black and you can completely lose your red reflex. And so here I'm just putting in a CTR. I obviously did not know preoperatively that this patient had uh, a zonulopathy. So just caution, if you know that there's a zonulopathy, take your time using tripan blue uh, or consider another method of um, capsulotomy. By the way, that uh, that iris speculum there is the X1 iris speculum from Biomatrix. It's, just, it's made of a nitinol ring, and so it's a lot more gentle on the iris, and I, I prefer it in um, eyes that are of shorter length, just because it's, it's just a very slim uh, profile. All right, so I want you to take a good look at this picture. This is a relatively dense lens, and my question is, would you utilize tripan or capsular dye on this case? And so we'll get that pull up here and I'll, um, I'll click back. So looking at this picture, would you utilize tripan or capsular dye on this case? And, and one thing I'll say about this is I've never regretted using tripan. I mean, maybe a couple the, the one or two times I've had it go posteriorly, I've been like, oh man, uh, but there wasn't really a lot of other options at the time in terms of getting through that white cataract. So, um, Let's see what our results are here. So yeah, about 74% would use Stripan. And I, I agree, I think that's totally reasonable. Um, one tip here. So I actually didn't use Stripan on this case. And you can see right there that glimmer of red reflex. Uh, and this is, this is a way that you can optimize your red reflex. And so what I'll do is uh, here, I'm just giving some uh, intracameral anesthetic. And then I'll switch off my oblique light or my part, um, you know, my uh, paraxial light and just use my coaxial. And you can see I can get this great view. And I check that first because I'm at the point now where I would either use tripan or proceed. But a great way to save resources is to check and see if by highlighting or illuminating the red reflex or maximizing your red reflex, if you can save yourself uh, the need for tripan. Now, that's not possible with all scopes. Uh, this is a Zeiss model, but you know, it, so it's a three uh, a three light microscope. The other microscopes like a Prescott's or a Lux or, or um, Leica may have two lights anyways. And so the red reflex may be slightly better from, from the onset, but you can certainly boost the light in different ways to try to maximize that red reflex. So there just the Rexus proceeds as normal. Um, just some other visualization techniques, you know, we, we can mark for torts, but we also have these digital markers now. Uh, that are integrated into our microscopes. And I have this technology, this is Varion, uh, and then there's also Callisto. And so I utilize both of these in my ORs. Uh, it's kind of a augmented reality view in a way because you're, you're, you know, it's just a heads up display as you're looking through your microscope in a really nice way to uh, digitally mark patients. Now, intraoperative gonioscopy. Uh, this is something that a lot of people think is is a very is a it's a challenge and it, and it is it, it's very different because it's a one-handed technique um, using a direct lens. These are some um, beautiful images shared with me by by Dr. Paul Singh, um, and he talks about obtaining uh, you know how to obtain a good view and, and getting this in, this on face view. And so and I'll go over all these steps, but tilt the head, tilt the microscope know how to hold the, the gonio prism. And so you wanna dangle it gently and I'll go over that a little bit more, but hold it gently. You don't wanna create those stria the same way 
when you're doing gonioscopy in the clinic. And so a good view is this on-face view, meaning the straight ahead, straight on view, and then know your anatomical structures, which are here. And um, again, I'm not gonna go into that too much because that's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. We're just talking about how to visualize the angle today. So here's me in the OR. This is uh, one of my microscopes. I've, I've got different ones. Some have um, different ways of adjusting. This one's a, this one's kind of nice. It's, a, it's an auto adjuster. Uh, so I'm gonna tilt my microscope about 20 to 35 degrees, um, and then the patient's head 25 to 40 degrees, depending on how much I tilt the microscope. So in this case, I didn't go for a ton of microscope tilt. I turned the patient's head a little more, but um, you certainly can and need to rotate both uh, in opposite directions. Just some different options. I just grabbed what I had in my OR to show that there are some different options for your gonio prisms. There's um, kind of this locked in mirror that um, Glaucos makes. Uh, that has, it's a left-handed mirror. There's a Volk surgical gonio, which I really like. I, so as an ambidextrous surgeon, I like to be able to switch between my left and right hand, depending on the type of mix procedure I'm doing. Uh, if I'm doing like an Omni or a Hydrus, a lot of times, depending on which direction I'm going, I'll switch hands. And this, this gonio prism, actually, you can rotate the handle from side to side, which is uh, very advantageous. And then there's another one that's kind of floating on a Thornton ring, which can be great for stabilization. It's not actually recommend for people learning to use, surgeons learning to use a gonio prism in the OR for the first time. Um, here's just another, this is just another OR. This, this um, surgeon had marked their microscope at 35 degrees. Once they had measured that, just using like an iPhone or some other, you know, protractor, whatever it may be, uh, it's just a way to get your staff to quickly maneuver to that position. So here's a couple different views. So this is the bulk gonio prism, and that's a left-handed view. Now what I'm going to do is rotate it around real quick just to show that you can obtain a right-handed view. And there you go. And you see real gentle touch. I'm using a dispersive viscoelastic on the surface to help couple the gonio prism and disrupt that ear tear uh, interface. Now, this is uh, just a different gonio prism that it's a kind of locked in, just left-handed only gonio prism, slightly slimmer profile, uh, but kind of locked in. And then here's the Thornton ring. And you can see you can see it does cause a little patient discomfort. So that's, that's one warning with that, uh, but it does provide excellent stability, which is great for when you're first learning. So, um, the biggest thing with, with MIGS and viewing the angle with the gonio prism is how you're holding your hand and how you're holding the lens. So if the pressure is on the heel of the gonio, you'll get uh, stria, you'll be able to visualize the angle. Um, but by relaxing the hand and lifting up on the heel, you will be able to visualize the TM. And there's a great video uh, here that, that um, Glaucos had made. And so here with the gonio prism nice and flat, again, that heel is lifted, you can see and read the words very clearly. But if the heel is, is depressed, watch what happens. Little tiny movement makes all the difference in the world. So that large text went to a very small distorted text just by rotation of the gonio prism. So get comfortable doing gonioscopy, intraoperative gonioscopy on routine cataract patients. That's the easiest way to start to learn how to visualize this. Another tip for visualizing the TM and where you need to actually be targeting your MIGs is by using tripan blue. So you can do a tripan blue stain, leave it in the eye, just fill the interior chamber for 60 seconds and get this beautiful view um, and I'll let you know exactly where to target. And then use a heavier viscoelastic. So I'm using a cohesive like ProVisc in these cases. Uh, but what I'll do is put a little plug of a dispersive in the wound, and then also use that dispersive to couple my gonio prism. So by putting a plug of dispersive, you can keep all that cohesive inside the eye while you're manipulating it. Um, now, obviously, if you start pushing down too hard with the gonio prism, it's all going to come back out anyways. So again, really temper your touch um, as you're manipulating the gonio prism. Here's just a, a, another great example of tripan blue. This was shared with me uh, by Dr. Bach Nguyen, one of my partners. Um, so before tripan blue here on the left image with tripan blue, and you can see the tripan blue has been scraped away by a cahook dual blade or a goniotomy procedure. Uh, just a really nice uh, visualization kind of montage there. And so here's a um, hydrus implantation. You can see a gonio prism, and this is uh, this is Dr. Wynn operating here. A beautiful technique. I'm gonna go in and just slide that uh, hydrus in. Now I'm gonna fast forward to his next video here. 
where he shows a Kahook dual blade, just so you can kind of see it in action. And the, you know, this is a goniotomy. So really your, your goal is to strip away or remove the trabecular meshwork uh, and really remove any of that uh, outflow resistance before the collector trail is there. So beautiful, beautiful procedures here. Um, this is just another example of a gonio prism. So this is a hands-free version. Um, and there's, there's a device called an eye prime that I like to do a two-handed technique with. So this is a lens that can be beneficial for that, although it does move. And so this is kind of a, a you know, an easy way to get started as well. Um, it clips on pretty easily uh, and you can visualize, you can see the trabecular meshwork there really nicely, but it moves. And let's see if uh, we'll get to it here in just a second. It's not on me password, but um, it does move. And so one, one tip if you're going to use that lens is to put a four by four nasally to help, help stabilize it. All right, only a couple more videos here and then, and then we'll take some questions. But um, this, is, this is showing me putting that viscoelastic, that dispersive viscoelastic right there in the incision. And then I'm gonna clear off the cornea. I wanna make sure that there's no heme and really watch where you're making your incisions. You don't really want to nick a bunch of limbal vessels and get a bunch of heme in the, uh, on the surface because that can distort your view if it gets mixed in with your OVD on the, on the surface. So now I'm rotating the head. You can see the scope is being rotated now and I'm trying to align everything um, in order to do the next part of the case. Um, typically I'll zoom in as well. I'll do a little zoom in and focus down, but you'll start seeing where you are once you put your gunia prism uh, in place. So here I'm um, just kind of getting everything ready. And it is a toric. You can see I've got that, that toric marker there. And here we come with the gonio prism. And you'll see I'll kind of rock my hand here, try to get the best view I can. Um, and there's a pretty good view coming in. This is a, so this is a hydrus. And I'm just going to choose my position here. And just gently slide that into position. And then I use the inserter just to kind of finish tucking it all the way in. Now, one thing you'll notice is as you manipulate or push into the trabecular meshwork, you can distort your view. As you're pushing the sclera away, the eye is gonna move or it's gonna cause a change in the curvature of the cornea. And so you can lose your view. So part of MIGS, remember a lot of these videos that we're sharing, these are the best videos we have. Like these are the best of the best. Sometimes the, the real world of MIGS is getting comfortable with not having the best views. But once you know the anatomy, once you're comfortable doing MIGS procedures and angle procedures, it becomes second nature, it really does. So this is another great tip uh, for doc that Dr. Singh likes to do. And he makes some incredible videos and his eyes are always so stable. And I'm always like, Paul, how do you do that? It's, it's incredible. Uh, how, how are your patients so compliant and still? And he's like, oh, I throw, I throw a traction suture. It's like, that's brilliant. So this is, this is another excellent idea um, for if you're trying to make some videos or getting started uh, or just want a really uh, just great view of the angle and not have to worry about the patient moving, go ahead and throw that suture there. Um, and it's, it's just a really, really smart way to approach this. So by utilize, utilizing tripan blue, uh, utilizing a Thornton ring or a traction suture, um, putting a plug of dispersive OVD right at the incision sites, uh, you can really maximize your view of the angle. And this is just a, you can take a picture of this if you want. This is just my suggested um, kind of uh, progression if you're going to move through different mix procedures, you know, start simple, start with just visualizing the angle in cataract surgery, and then move on to more advanced procedures. Now you can get some bleeding. Um, so just being able to just know to avoid some mix procedures in patients who are on anticoagulation or have risk of bleeding. So, so that's it that for my talk. Thank you so much to Orbis and Cybersight and Volk for sponsoring the talk. Thank you, Dr. Wen and Dr. Singh for sharing some of your slides and videos. And uh, this, was, this was a pleasure and, and really fun to, to share with you all. And thank you so much. Uh, we have a question here. How, how can you use the smartphone for capturing the inner part of the eye like the retina? So, um, you know, I think, I think the, the easiest way, and this is a, a method I used to use on call, is you take a 20 diopter lens or a 28 diopter lens in one hand and turn on video with your cell phone. So if you put video on with a flashlight, so, 
you know, you got your light, that's your illumination source with your 20 adapter lens. On video, you can really easily capture through, you know, this has to be a midriatic pupil, a dilated pupil, but you can document the posterior pole pretty well by doing that. Um, if you see, so we have another question. If you see a closed angle with the patient looking straight, but open when the patient looks into the mirror without an indentation, how would you document that? Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, that, that sounds like someone who may be narrow or just have a steeper insertion. Um, so, you know, as long as you can see the angle and, and visualize it without an indentation, I think that it's, um, you know, it, it more just has to do with the insertion than, um, than necessarily uh, pathology, but, you know, that's, that's kind of a, I, I'd have to see it to really know how to, how to document that, but, but good question. Some very nice, very nice comments coming in. So thank you for that. It's, it's, um, it's been fun. I'm, I, I love sharing this kind of stuff and, and it's, it's a privilege to get to talk to you guys. So um, is locating the corneal wedge. Okay. So here's a good question. Is locating the corneal wedge essential for proper identification of the angle structure that can be done accurately without this technique? So the parallel haploid or the corneal wedge typically will converge uh, at Schwabe's line when doing gonioscopy. And so that really is a great way if you're learning gonioscopy to figure out where Schwabe's line is. And from that, you can go down and know that you're going to have, um, you know, your anterior non-pigmented TM and then pigmented TM, scleral spur, and then sorry, body band. So yes, I think it's it's a, it's something to know. Um, once you get used to seeing the angle, it's pretty quick and easy to pick up scleral spur and TM. But I think starting off that, that yeah, utilizing the corneal wedge and the parallel void is, is a good technique for that too. Good question. Um, so, okay, so you mentioned you can you can use about any gonial lens for SLT, not laser specific. Yeah, so you technically could. I mean, it really any, any mirrored lens can be used for, um, for SLT. Now, there are advantages to using SLT specific lenses because typically the magnification is better or they're coming at a steeper approach. So there's a reason I prefer to use, or those are the reasons I prefer to use um, like the, the rapid SLT that, that bulk makes because it is just such a, it's, it's a nice blend of magnification uh, and wide field view, as well as on a small but steep platform that gives me a great view of, um, of the angle architecture. Which power settings do I use for LPI? So for my LPIs, I typically use two millijoules uh, per shot. I don't typically use burst, two millijoules per shot uh, and, and no offset. How would I proceed if the lens comes off during SLT? So typically, um, you know, this happens sometimes. The patient gets uncomfortable. They have to cough. They have to sneeze. They lean back too far. Um, you just put it right back on. You can sometimes you have to apply a little more, um, a little more coupling agent. Make sure there's no bubbles in that coupling agent. That's another thing that can distort your view. Um, but you know, you can just kind of get back right where you were. If you know which mirror you're in and what you've done, um, then you can kind of get get right uh, right back to where you were. When we increase the magnification for MIGs, the illumination becomes very dim. How do we overcome that? You know, that's a challenge. It's true. As you, as you zoom in um, for MIGs, you can lose some view. So, you know, you have to balance that. And different gonio prisms have different advantages when it comes to how much light. So a, a lens that's a wider, thicker lens, a lot of times will trap and direct more light uh, into the angle than something that's a little uh, more narrow in terms of a gonio prism. Um, so that's, you know, it's really just a balance. I mean, you can, you can uh, increase your light when you're looking at the angle, but in general, when you mag in, you'll, you'll start losing some, um, some illumination. It's, it's, just a, it's just kind of part of the optics of the system. Um, but I, with a lot of the techniques we talked about today, I think that that's something that um, generally isn't an issue. Like I, I don't generally find illumination um, of the angle to be too much of an issue. Does the PI have to be peripheral or should you find the best crypt? So yeah, it, it, if you can find a peripheral crypt, obviously that's ideal, um, but it doesn't have to be uh, in a crypt. It's preferred, but it doesn't have to be. Um, I do think it needs to be peripheral and as, as peripheral as you can get it um, because it's just better for the patient in terms of glare and halos um, and other dysphotopsias. When it looks like the angle is narrow or partially closed, which is the best treatment, uh, surgically or medication. So there's not really a lot of great medications for angle, for angle closure. I mean, you can try to constrict the pupil, but that's a temporary fix. 
So if it's a young patient, I prefer to go with an LPI or laser peripheral iridotomy. If it's a patient who is, you know, 50, has some, you know, or, or older, has some degree of cataract, I typically will recommend a lens-based surgery because it's a permanent solution uh, and, and it creates just so much more room uh, in the in the anterior chamber. A lot of those patients are already plus threes or plus fours, you know, they're high hyperopes. And so not only will a lens-based procedure improve their angle anatomy, improve their anterior chamber uh, and deepen it, but also will improve their vision. But I typically, if a patient doesn't have an outright cataract, uh, will let um, the patient kind of decide. Any tips to deposit? Uh, it's remove deposits from an eye service with, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, there's there's a few videos out there that, I, that I've done. I showed a few today of removing um, some anterior capsular membranes with the YAG laser. I typically use uh, low power, so you know, 0.8 to one millijoules per shot. Um, and then with either a zeroed offset or about a 100 micron anterior offset uh, in order to, to do that. And I start in the periphery and kind of follow my original anterior capsulotomy edge. And then there's some deposits that unfortunately you can't get off. Um, you know, whether it's a silicone lens that has some calcifications, you know, sometimes you can't get it off with a YAG laser and you just have to do an ILO exchange. Uh, 